We've set up lasso and ridge regression. We've talked about sparsity for lasso. We've talked about um, optimization. So some crucial pieces out of the way. Now we're going to go for a deeper dive and investigate a lot of the questions you guys actually brought up at the beginning, which is how does this thing deal with different characteristics of the input. So you're saying, oh, what if you have linearly dependent features, repeated features, or correlated features? What's, what's going to happen? And uh, we have some nice visuals uh, for that, but we're going to start algebraic. All right. So let's start with the simplest case, the simplest question there, which is linearly dependent features. So and the simplest version of that is, of course, exactly repeated features. So let's start with just one feature, x1. And we have a response variable y. And we fit linear regression. So input space reals, output space reals. And we find the empirical risk minimizer is 4x1. Right? That's our prediction function. Input is x1, output is 4x1. So what happens if we get a new feature, x2, but x2 is exactly equal to x1, all right? And we could fit our model. We could, we could minimize our empirical risk, constrained or not. And we'll get some answer, right? But let's investigate what happens. So x2 gives no new information. An ERM is still 4x1, because it can just ignore x2, right? There's nothing there. But there's also some new empirical risk minimizers, right? Because you could split the weight between x1 and x2 arbitrarily. arbitrarily. You could put 2 on x1 and 2 on x2. x1 equals x2, so you just collect these. It could be right, um, 1 and 3, put it all on x2. It doesn't matter. So there's a whole set of infinitely many ways to divide the weight between x1 and x2. And they're all equivalent, at least in terms of the prediction function. Um, but what happens if we introduce L1 or L2 regularization into the picture, right? So we do ERM with a constraint, an L1 or L2 constraint. So in this case, the ERM is, one of them is 4x1. And we know that the full set of empirical risk minimizers is going to be any combination of W1 and W2 that sum to 4, right? Because that's what, that's what was the original ERM. So let's make a little table of the possible values. W1 and W2, everything in these two columns sum to four, right? all pairs. Now the L1 norm of W for the first three rows are all the same. Right? The sum of the absolute values, four plus zero, four, they're all positive, so these are all four. And only here where one of them goes negative does the sum of the absolute values change. It gets larger. Right? So when these things are different signs, when they kind of cross over zero, that's when we can start getting larger L1 norms. But otherwise, L1 complexity, it's indifferent to all three of these different ways to divide the weight between W1 and W2. That's important. So W1 kind of doesn't care how you split the weight as long as they are the same sign. W2 does care. The sum of the squares, um, how would you characterize uh, the division between W1 and W2 that minimizes the L2 complexity? Yeah, it's L2 complexity is minimized when you spread the weight equally between W1 and W2. Um, and so it's going to choose, it's going to prefer, if we're minimizing the L2 complexity, the one that splits the weight evenly between W1 and W2. And it's, uh, L1 constraint is, is less, less picky. Just wants them the same sign. All right, All right let's, let's do a picture of what's going on here. So again, to, just resetting up the same problem. Two equal features, a linear prediction function, some linear combination of x1 and x2. All parameter values on this line, w1 plus w2 equals some constant k, give the same predictions and have the same empirical risk. Right? Because it's just dividing the weight. If x, see, x2 shows up twice. It's literally, as long as w1 and w2 have the same sum, it's literally the same prediction function. All right. So. Here's what's happening here. This brown line, W1 plus W2 is equal to, don't ask how these numbers were chosen, 2 root 2 plus 3.5. That is the set of empirical risk minimizers. Remember that in this case, with duplicate features, W1, uh, x1 equals x2, 
uh, we're going to have a line of solutions, right? Okay, so that's, that's the brown line. That's kind of equivalent to the W hat in the other picture. There it was just a point, but now it's a line because there's all these equivalent representations of the exact same function. Um, interestingly, just like as we moved away from the optimal solution to try to have lower L1 norm or L2 norm, we got these uh, ellipses of equal empirical risk. Well, now what we have is kind of like, imagine ellipses with infinite, ax one of the axes is infinite. So basically what you get is two parallel lines. You could think of that as an infinite ellipse. Um, and so that's what's happening here. As we, the lines parallel to the brown one, are suboptimal solutions in the sense that they have lower empirical risk, but they have also lower L2 norm in this case. So as we move closer to zero L2 norm, it's like sliding this parallel line. Each, every point on this line, remember, is the same prediction function. Right? And so we're just finding where does this line of, these lines of prediction functions first intersect this norm ball, this norm constraint. In this case, uh, we constrained it to have norm two. And what you find geometrically is that it's going to intersect exactly at a point where w1 is equal to w2, which is also what we came up with algebraically, that when you minimize the L2 norm um, among all these functions that give the same value, you're going to get a preference for the weight being split equally among the, among the parameters. All right, now what happens with L1 norm? Everything's the same, except now the shape of this constraint set has changed. And now the first point of intersection is not a point anymore. It's this entire edge, because the, the line of equivalent solutions is exactly parallel to the constraint set edge. And so anything on this edge is going to be a valid solution. And that's exactly the ambiguity we saw with the L1 norm, where it was, it was um, indifferent among any choice of the ways to divide the weight as long as they were the same sign. So in this case, everything in this quadrant is the same sign. As soon as you cross either of these axes, you have different signs and then you're no longer at a solution. You're no longer, nothing on this line satisfies the constraint, which is to say inside this box. Okay. All right, so this is our geometric picture of this um, indifference between uh, about where you put the weight for equal input features. All right. So this is a very specific setting, exactly in equal input features. It's not, I mean, it could happen in practice, but it's more like a, a mistake or it's an easy thing to, to track down. Um, but let's, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's suppose we have uh, linearly dependent features, but not exactly the same. So, or the most simple version of that, which is one feature is a, a scaled version of another one, right? So let's say x2 is two times x1. No new information, but they're a different scale, so not exactly the same anymore. What happens? Do you guys have a guess about, let's suppose we are doing um, L1 regularization, all right? And uh, we only have two variables, x1 and x2. x2 is, is exactly twice x1. Now, there'll be a whole set of uh, values for W1 and W2 that give the exact same prediction function, right? Turns out you can work out very easily that whenever W1 plus two times WK, W2 is some fixed constant K, then they all give the same, anything on this line gives the same uh, predictions, right? And they have the same empirical risk, so. So, of the solutions on this line, which ones would have the smallest L1 norm? Those are the same most all the weights to W2. The one that assigns all the weight to W2. You said W2. So what's, is W2, so W2 corresponds to X2. Um, are the feature values of X2 larger or smaller than X1? X2 is larger, X2 is twice as large as X1. And so to get the same prediction function, would you, need, you need a parameter value that's larger or smaller? Smaller, because X2 is bigger than X1, so to get the same prediction value, the corresponding coefficient would be smaller, 
Okay. And smaller coefficients have smaller, contribute less to the norm. So you'd want to put, in some sense, you want to put more weight on the, on the feature that's a larger scaled version because the parameter you need is smaller. Okay, let's, let's work that on some, with some visuals. So here we've drawn the lines. Um, so it's assuming that, uh, so x2 is still 2 times x1. And so the lines of, of parameter values that all give the exact same prediction function now uh, look like these lines with this slope. And now when we look at where that intersects the L2 norm ball, it's a lot, for L2 norm, it's a lot closer to 0 for W1 and I guess to 2 for W2. So it's putting a lot more weight on W2, which is indeed the corresponding to the feature that's bigger in magnitude. So W2 penalty, so L2 penalty wants to put more weight, everything wants to put more weight on the features that are bigger in magnitude because it costs less because the parameters you need are smaller. So the L1 or L2 penalty you get for using them is less. So any kind of norm penalty is trying to, if you have a kind of two features, one a rescaled version of the other, you want to put more weight on the feature for the bigger, more weight on the parameter corresponding to the bigger feature because the parameter doesn't have to be as large. So that's what's happening here. W1 is smaller, W2 is bigger. And then when we do L1 regularization, it, it, it lands on a corner. So it's putting all the weight on W2 and no weight on W1. So remember what happened when W1 and W2 are equal? L1 didn't care. It, would spread the, it could spread the weight anywhere between W1 and W2. That's when they're exactly equal. But if they're slightly unequal, then it's going to throw all the weight onto the one that is larger in magnitude. Okay. This, is, this is still like one is a multiple of the other. OK, I just wanted to build some intuition on the importance of the magnitude of your features. And in practice, the first thing you do when doing a linear method is you rescale all your features to have the same magnitude. Or you center and scale them by the standard deviation or something. So you, um, you, don't, you would generally not expect to be in the situation in practice, because what we all tell you is the first thing to do is to standardize your columns. So, um, so the summary so far, L1 spreads the weight arbitrarily for exactly identical features, and L2 tries to spread it evenly. If they're related features, then L1 seems to choose the one with larger scale, and L2 spreads them kind of proportionally to the scale. So this is something I mentioned earlier. The um, ellipses that we got earlier correspond to the level sets of the empirical risk for these um, degenerate scenarios where one feature is exactly a multiple of the other, that corresponds to um, our design matrix, remember the matrix of all the x's, uh, being ranked, not, not full rank. You have linearly, linear dependencies between the columns. And so um, when you look at the matrix x transpose x, x is the design matrix, x transpose x, that's sitting in the middle of our formula for the ellipsoid, that's going to have uh, at least when eigenvalue is zero, and so it's going to be a degenerate ellipse, and that's why we get those parallel lines instead of ellipses for the level sets um, in that case. OK. But what happens, all right, so so far we've talked about these like really degenerate cases. But more typically, you'll have like maybe strong correlations between features, but not exact linear dependencies. Right? So what happens? What do these things look like when we have um, highly correlated features? And what I want to argue as far as the ellipses is that we will have very eccentric ellipses. Um, because even though and there's no exactly zero eigenvalue necessarily, you'll have very small eigenvalues because you have a lot of dependence, linear, um, very close to linearly dependent columns. And so you'll end up with ellipses that are very um, elongated. So here's an example. So here's a very elongated set of level sets. And we're looking at L1 regularization. Now remember, when this completely degenerate, uh, and this is, uh, yeah. So when we're completely, this is the same scale. The X, X1 and, w1, X1 and X2 are kind of the same scale 
um, and highly correlated. So when they're exactly correlated, they're linearly dependent, the level sets are lines, and we got that, um, we got the uh, ambivalence between, the indifference between where you choose along this edge. Uh, when it's highly correlated, what happens? Are we still indifferent to where we, where, where we choose along this edge? In other words, if we solve this optimization problem, we're looking for where the, these level set first intersect the constraint. And is it going to be at a point or the entire edge in this case? Yeah, it's just a point. But where is it going to be? It's, it's going to be somewhere. It's going to be somewhere along this edge, but it's really hard to tell. It depends on the exact angle of this ellipse, right? So, so I've, we've drawn two. Yeah. So in the first picture on the left, it seems like it's probably going to hit that, ed, that the first corner, as you said, and in the second one, it looks like it's going to hit the the corner on W1, and it's just from a really slight perturbation of the data that can tilt this ellipse just a little bit and it vastly changes the solution. You go from, in this case, all the weight on this corner, so W1 is 0, and a slight perturbation puts all the weight on W1 and none on W2. So with highly correlated variables, the last solution is really unstable. Bless you, and this is why. Okay. Now what happens if things were highly correlated but of different scale? So x1 is approximately equal to 2 times x2, but not exactly equal. All right. So what happens to this picture? It's going to pick x1. So it will be an angle. An angle will, so, they, so you might expect that they do not be you know, parallel to the minus 1 slope, but maybe like a minus. Uh, exactly. So this, this scale, the difference in scale, changes the slope of the major axis. It's still elongated ellipses, but it's now angled. And when it's f angled more, small perturbations no longer change the intersection point. So it's not going to be unstable if they're unequal. What's going to happen? Something very predictable is going to happen in the case that x1 is approximately equal to 2x2. Where's it going to put all the weight on x1? It's going to put, it prefers to put the weight on the feature that's larger because it costs less in parameter value. The parameters can be smaller when the feature values are larger. So it's going to prefer to put the weight on the parameter, on a smaller parameter, on the parameter corresponding to the larger feature. Is that clear? I think so. OK. So the orientation changes, and it's going to hit that corner very clearly. So it's only unstable when they're of the same scale. This is like the same image you showed in that quora thing, right? That this could be that. Ah. Right, so, so this is, this is the, the giant ellipse that's almost the line, right? But as far as answering the Quora question, I think we are actually already passed that. So that was, that was this, this picture, I think. So the, the Quora image, to me, the best guess at what the original person maybe should have intended or actually did intend, I'm not sure, is, uh, is kind of this degenerate case with dependent uh, variables. That's where you get lines. That's my best explanation. All right. So we have a bit of a handle on what happens now for correlated variables of the same scale for a lasso and, f and for different scales but highly correlated. There's a proposal. It's called the elastic net. And the idea of elastic net is take your L1 regularization and throw in a little bit of L2 regularization. So remember, L2 regularization, it likes to spread the weight evenly among uh, features that are of the same scale. Say, say they're highly correlated and of the same scale. So L2 regularization encourages equal spread of the weight. And, and if we add in a little bit of that, that should help even the distribution of the weight among the correlated features. So we have. We have an illustration of that, sure. So here we again have our level sets, same ellipses. But now, this is the constraint set corresponding to this little bit of L1 and a little bit of L2 in our complexity measure, and that's bounded. And note that the, the constraint set now is 
it bulges out, right? We've broken that straight line edge, and now it bulges out. And so now, even slight perturbations of the orientation of this ellipse is still going to hit somewhere close to that middle point. That spreads the weight equally. It's going to have to have quite a perturbation to hit it at a corner. So that little bit of L2 regularization we add in, which is it's called elastic net, keeps the weight um, more evenly distributed among these correlated, even in scenarios where you have correlated variables. So what you expect to happen is these batches of correlated variables of the same scale will have the weight spread more evenly among them. And so, um, OK, and here's our sparsity picture. So for elastic net, it's not as easy to get sparsity as for elastic, but we still have regions where we're going to get sparsity, <clears throat> the colored regions. Uh, any questions? It's kind of the, I think this is the, this is the end of our practical investigation of lasso and, and elastic net and, and ridge regression. Yeah? So when we say correlated, we, in this context, we just mean like nearly identical. Because squares could be correlated, but that wouldn't fall into the same treatment plane. You know, one variable is x, another is x squared. Oh. You don't need to well, one second, one second. So um, I, I, when I say correlated, uh, what you should picture is that it's easy to predict one of the variables from the other with a linear function, an affine function. Yeah. So um, if, if one is x1 and x2 is the square of x1, they're dependent. One is deterministic function of the other. But the correlation is maybe weak because the linear function is not going to be a good approximation once the squared shoots up at a much faster rate. So the correlation may not be so great. But the dependence is there. We don't mean the correlation as it's normally defined. I mean the correlation as it's normally mathematically defined, which is a linear relationship between the two variables. So if you just want to say that they are related, by, like one is predictable from the other, correlation is not really the precise word. You really want to say dependent. Yeah, highly dependent or highly predictable from the other one. Correlation in, a, in, in our context is uh, referring precisely to a, a linear relationship. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll just point you to uh, some theorems if you have a more of a theoretical bent. And this is a theorem on elastic net, which tells us basically what we see empirically and what we want to happen, which is that suppose we have two features that are correlated, like with an amount rho ij. And uh, we run our elastic net, and we get parameters corresponding to those two features, wi and wj. Uh, let's suppose all of our y's and our x's are, are centered and, and standardized to so have standard deviation 1. Um, then if they, so this is the, the product is greater than 0. So if, if the two parameters are the same sign, then the difference between the parameter values of i and j for these correlated random variables is, ignore the first part for now, it's, it's less than the square root of 1 minus the correlation. So in other words, if the correlation between xi and xj is very large, it's very large, they're close to 1 then this expression is close to 0, which means the parameter values for wi and wj are very, very close together. So highly correlated features of the same scale lead, by this theorem, to parameter values that are very close to each other, which is satisfying, because that's what we are kind of pitching geometrically. OK. Finito. I'll hang around if you guys have questions.